All right. Recording started. All right. Well, hello, everyone. Um, I know I've uh, spoken with many of you in the past, but uh, for anyone who doesn't know me, I'm Tyler Williams. Uh, I'll be talking today about uh, um, star schema data modeling. So this is part of our series on uh, data architecture and data engineering. Um, so yeah, specifically um, talking about uh, yeah, how to model uh, the tables in your database uh, using the star schema approach. Um, so just a uh, little visual here, just as a high level overview, and I'll, I'll dive into this a little bit more. Um, but the diagram on the left here shows uh, um, a, a simple example of a star schema in, in your data warehouse um, compared to a snowflake schema, which is a little bit more complex here on the right. Um, so just to get a little bit more into the specifics there um, after seeing that visual, um, the star schema, uh, this was a, a design that was popularized by Ralph Kimball. Um, and it, it, the, the whole intention of the star schema is to flatten out third normal form. So typically with a transactional database, um, you'll hear that uh, the, it's modeled using third normal form. Um, a lot of uh, data engineers use that terminology. A lot of people kind of instinctively, just uh, over time having worked in these environments, uh, kind of know what it is. Um, but uh, it sometimes helps if, uh, if you're not as familiar with it to have a bit of a definition. So um, there are several different levels um, of normality and they each build on one another. So the first normal form, um, is uh, pretty simple. It just means that every data field um, within your table holds a single value, so you don't have um, any composite values. So um, it wouldn't be like an array or um, uh, uh, complex uh, data types, you know, like a struct or anything like that. Just a, a simple single value. Um, moving then, building on that into the second normal form, um, you're reducing redundant data. So um, if, uh, uh, if you've got a record that has um, a lot of details, uh, say, you know, describing a person, um, you might have, uh, you know, first name, last name, um, I don't know, maybe uh, uh, birth uh, state or birth country, um, the gender, uh, different things like that. And if you have it just all in one table, all of those attributes would be repeated multiple times since you'd have multiple people that are born in the same state or the same country. Um, and then a lot of people that have the same gender. So the, the second normal form would be reducing re redundant data by spinning a lot of those attributes off into their own tables and uh, using uh, keys to join them. Um, and then the third normal form builds upon that a little bit further in that uh, when you have uh, your, your table defined, um, the, the formal definition that you'll see in a lot of places is that uh, no attributes in the table will have transitive dependence on the primary key. Um, and that's a little difficult to understand. So trying to simplify that into uh, more uh, layman's terms, it would be that uh, within your table, you can modify attributes, so uh, column values, uh, without having an impact on the, the key uh, for that table. So that's just a, a little bit of a definition of the third normal form, again, which you'll find more commonly in um, transactional databases. Uh, but when we're moving to the star schema, we're flattening that out. So we're essentially undoing all of that and, and returning to um, a format that does have more of the redundant data again. Um, and while you, you have a bit of a trade-off in that uh, it'll take up more storage space, um, since storage is pretty cheap, we aren't as concerned about that. Um, and the, the goal really is for performance. Uh, but I'll get into that a little bit more as well. Um, but uh, then talking again about the, the star schema specifically, 
Um, the way it's set up, you'll have a, a what's called a fact table, and that's sort of your central table. Um, so if we look at this diagram here, um, you, it's uh, it looks almost like a hub and spoke type of thing. So the hub, the central table is your fact table. And then radiating from that are all of your dimension tables. And so your fact table is going to be the quantitative table. So really your your measures and the, the numbers that you're trying to, to count and aggregate for whatever reporting you're trying to do. Um, whereas the dimensions that are that spin off of that are all qualitative in nature. So they're um, the ways you want to slice your data. So the the various attributes of the the things that you want to want to slice. So an example here might include um, uh, making uh, purchases online. So your fact table might be um, uh, the the actual order, and then the dimensions would be um, you know the person who placed that order, um, the product that's being uh, purchased, um, the date on which it's being purchased. And so you can slice your metrics by any of these uh, dimensions um, and aggregate it uh, along those lines. Um, specifically, we use the star schema, schema because it has, uh, um, it's a very beneficial design for use in um, reporting and analysis. So specifically, um, you can feed data from your star schema into an analysis services database or Power BI data sets um, or other uh, visualization tools. Um, so talking a little bit about star schema versus snowflake schema. And again, here are these, these pictures to help distinguish them a little bit. Um, the star schema is, uh, again, you know, more simplified, um, but it's flatter. So in any of your dimension tables, if you have um, any hierarchies set up. So a good example would be date. Um, so you'll have a, a date and any given date is part of a month and then a month rolls up to a quarter and a quarter rolls up to a year. Um, so that type of hierarchy would be fully contained within the dimension table itself. Whereas in a snowflake schema, you would uh, often see those hierarchies split out. So you could have um, a Another fairly typical example would be, um, uh, say, employees and managers. Um, so you could have a separate manager table, and then different employees in the employee dimension would roll up to the managers in the manager dimension. Um, again, the star schema, it's more denormalized. It's a little bit flatter, um, which does introduce more redundancy. But it allows it to be a much simpler design, and it generally has faster queries when you're using it uh, because you have fewer joins to get all of the data points that you need for your reporting. Um, whereas the Snowflake schema, it's still denormalized, but it it adds, uh, it introduces a little bit more normalization into it um, since you do have these um, other dimension tables that branch off of your, um, your base dimension table. So you can see the design is a little bit more complex and your queries in turn will be more complex because you need to do more joins um, to get all of your data points. Um, let's see, I have a link here if you wanted to do a little bit more research on your own. Um, there's some more information at this link. Um, so why would we really care about a star schema? I mean, in this day and age, um, you know, there, there's so many ways to interact with data. Um, uh, People are always storing data in a data lake. You have uh, Internet of Things uh, constantly streaming data into a data lake um, and, and various ways to get at data. So why would you want to spend the time to transform it and put it into a star schema in a database? Um, there are several reasons why um, the, the star schema does have value. Um, one, it organizes the data and makes it um, very easy to use, uh, particularly in the case of self-service BI. So if you grant end users access to your database with the star schema, um, it's generally pretty intuitive how the tables relate to one another and how the data can be queried if, uh, if someone has 
um, you know, even basic SQL skills to be able to do some joins between tables and select columns. Um, and then as mentioned previously as well, um, query performance uh, is, is very good within a star schema um, just because of the simplicity of the joins and the flattened nature of that data. So um, you get pretty good performance uh, when you're using it as a data source for your dashboards and reports and, and visualization tools. Um, it also has a well-defined static schema. So um, again, for your, your visualizations, uh, you can import a data model and then use that. And it, it's pretty easy then to be able to select your columns and be able to apply filters and, and slice your data across various uh, dimensions and, and being able to aggregate it. Um, and again, one of the, the concepts um, is that you'll have simple data types within your star schema. So, um, you, you know, you'll have your, your strings, your numeric types, uh, Booleans, um, but none of the complex data types like arrays or structs. Um, and then another beneficial um, aspect of this design is that you have very clear one-to-many relationships. So, um, uh, so yeah, the, the relationships between um, your dimension table and your fact table, um, it, it'll always be a one to many. So it, it's very easy to implement. And a lot of visualization tools, um, thinking about uh, Power BI in particular, uh, they perform best when you have uh, a one to many relationship. Um, things get significantly more complicated when you have many to many relationships between tables. Um, and then uh, another point worth mentioning is an ease of maintenance of the star schema. So uh, if you need to make any updates, altering values within a dimension table, you can easily do that um, without having to change, um, change the, the foreign keys within the fact table. So talking a little bit about some design considerations uh, when you're building out a star schema within your database. So I did just mention foreign keys. Um, and while technically you will have, um, you can have foreign key relationships uh, because you'll have your primary key within your dimension table and uh, the corresponding key within your fact table that, that matches to that and allows you to do your join. Um, but just in my experience, uh, I recommend avoiding explicitly defining um, foreign key constraints on your tables. Um, so, and there are a couple of reasons uh, for avoiding the, uh, these constraints that are managed by the database itself. Um, it, one, it, well, the primary thing is uh, just the, the processing overhead. Um, a lot of times when you're processing, processing data and loading data into your database, um, you want to be able to, to load it quickly and there is overhead, uh, you know, as you're inserting records because the, the database engine needs to check and verify that uh, the constraint is not being violated. Um, and with the, by not having the foreign keys, you don't have to worry about that. And really um, it's not, it, like in a well-designed system, it shouldn't be that much of an issue anyway, um, because your ETL process should be um, validating those relationships because for inserting data into the fact tables, you'll be necessarily doing lookups against your uh, dimension tables to get the appropriate keys to insert into the fact table. So um, you shouldn't have any instances anyway where, um, where there's the possibility of inserting uh, invalid keys. Um, another uh, item for, uh, to, to consider when building out your star schema is the use of surrogate keys. Um, so the surrogate keys, uh, what we mean by this is just uh, a, a key that serves as the primary key on the table. So in, in this case, we want a key that doesn't have any kind of business meaning at all. Um, and so typically what we'll use is just uh, an identity column in the table, and it'll just be incremental as you add new records to the, the dimension table, this key will just increment. Um, so uh, yeah, since it is just a, an incremental identity column, that key 
ends up not having any business meaning. Um, it, it's it's divorced from any business logic within your your database. Um, and uh, one of the the main reasons for that, um, and that's something I'll get into here in the next couple slides, um, is for uh, using it uh, within slowly changing dimensions. Um, so your business key is going to have uh, some other functions, and it can possibly be repeated within your table. And uh, you need to have a unique key um, for uh, a unique primary key for your table. So, um, so that's why you need the separate key um, to serve as your surrogate. Um, one exception that I will mention is it, it's very common in a date dimension to have a smart key as the uh, the key, the primary key field. Um, and what I mean by a smart key is that the the key itself, while it is still an integer value, um, it does have inherent meaning to it. So in this case, the the date key for a date dimension would be formatted as a YYYY MMDD um, integer. And so, um, you know, to represent today, it'd be 2021-0917. Um, the reason for this is because um, the the date dimension is going to be very static, and so you don't really have to worry about changes happening within the dimension. And it makes things a lot easier when um, using that date key within your fact tables, uh, because it, in many cases, will allow you to avoid having to do another join um, in your queries, because um, you can just use this key directly, and it has uh, built-in meaning. Um, so. Anyway, the, so separating the the business function um, from the the surrogate key, um, it it allows you yeah to have the the business key or the natural key separate from the primary key of the table, and then one uh, key that is common uh, typically in in many implementations um, is to insert a special record for any dimension that has a negative one. Um, primary key, and this will be the default unknown record. So this is what you would insert um, as your default anytime you do lookups against a dimension and don't get a match based on your, um, your business key. Um, the reason we do this is uh, because uh, particularly when we're doing aggregations within our fact tables, uh, you don't want nulls um, in, in your fact table um, because the uh, when you're looking at the fact table, all of these keys um, to the other dimensions uh, in combination well enough with one another represent really the, the primary key for the fact table itself. And so all of the, the keys to the dimensions, um, the combination of them should be unique uh, within uh, the fact table. So every record should be unique. Um, and with nulls, just since you have odd behaviors and depending on um, which database engine or which tools you're using, nulls can be treated differently in different scenarios. So, um, so we like to use a, an actual value in those set scenarios. Um, and then just uh, considerations in, make, in your design for when you update records uh, for dimensions, you wanna determine um, in many cases, you will have values that change. And so you need to determine which columns can change in your dimension. And do we need to maintain a history? <clears throat> so a historical record of those values. Um, for facts, some of the things to think about are, um, are we gonna be doing incremental loads into the fact table or do we do full loads where we truncate and reprocess the entire fact table? Um, the, the size of the fact table will definitely be um, one of the determining factors there. And then if we do incremental, are we only doing only ever doing insert um, inserts of records into the fact tables? Or will we ever have to look back at um, previously inserted records and make updates to some of the values there? Um, so talking about uh, the dimensions, uh, a very important concept in the star schema is the idea of a slowly changing dimension. Um, and so this is, um, a situation where one or more attributes 
of an entity in your dimension table is expected to change over time. And so you need some way to determine if and how the historical values should be retained um, in that dimension. So some attributes that might change um, as an example here uh, for people, um, a person's name might change over time, uh, their height could change, they might change professions over time. Um, or other, another example is property. If you have a property dimension, the owner of that property might change over time or the value of the property. Um, <clears throat> and there's a, a link here um, talking a little bit more about uh, slowly changing dimensions. So you can read that for a little bit more information. Um, and then for an example for the next, for talking about some of the specific types of slowly changing dimensions, I'll be using this as uh, somewhat of an example. So say we have a person here, Peter Vinkman, um, and his profession has changed over time. So he's gone from a college professor at one point to a paranormal investigator to a television host. So um, let's use that example to talk about the different types of slowly changing dimensions. So first, um, the type zero slowly changing dimension is a fairly trivial example. This is also known as just a, a fixed dimension. So this is one where it's really essentially not an SCD. Um, it, uh, the attributes will never change and you only have new records that will be inserted into the table. So some examples would be a date table um, and then also reference tables. If you have a dimension that just has your, a single attribute and the key, um, typically that single attribute is gonna be um, the, the natural key that you're doing, you know, against which you're doing lookups. So that can never be updated in place. And so you would just um, insert new records as new values come in. Um, so that's pretty trivial type. The next one is a type one. And this is one where you don't maintain any history. You simply overwrite um, previous values with the new values. Um, so here, just uh, following that example, um, the way this record would look first, you have the person, social security number is what I'm using here for the uh, the natural key for this person, um, first name and last name, and then the profession. He was a college professor, pro college professor. Um, now he's a TV host, so that value just gets updated in place. One of the more common types of slowly changing dimensions that you'll find, the SCD type two, is one where you keep a full history of, uh, of the values for um, the particular attributes. So in this case, again, following the, the changes in profession, professions of Peter Venkman, um, we can see what it looks like in the table. So we have the same natural key, first name and last name, and then the profession that we had before, but now we introduce um, effective dates for each row. So when uh, the record was first inserted, he was a college professor and this row was effective from uh, September, 1978 through March of 1984. And then when he became a paranormal investigator, you can see um, this, uh, the first uh, row was end dated and we start on the subsequent date um, and then have another date range for that. And then the last one, um, TV host has the current date. And typically what we'll do is uh, for the end date, um, in some instances, people will implement this with a, a null value. Um, but a lot of times you'll be using um, a between clause to find the particular row um, that you're looking for. And so nulls again, get a little bit difficult to work with. So um, more often I found that it's easier to just put a far future date for the end date um, to represent the current row. So in this case, uh, we extend that all the way out to 1231.9999. You can see here the natural key has remained the same across all three records. And the surrogate key, um, is the primary key is the one that's going to get um, updated and in incremented each time we insert a new record here. 
Um, let's see. So the next type is a, an SCD type three. So this is uh, unlike the type two, it doesn't preserve a full history of the values. Um, all we care about is the current value and the prior value. Um, so you can see what it looks like here, again, going from um, college professor to paranormal investigator and then to TV host. So the way the record would look before is uh, like this. And then as soon as it changes, we take the current profession, it gets written into the prior profession column. And, um, and then the new current profession gets written into the current profession column. And then we stamp we update the, the date change with the, the date on which this change occurred. Um, the next type is type four. Um, and this is a type a, a pattern we'll typically see not so much for a slowly changing dimension, but what people might call a rapidly changing dimension. So where several attributes are uh, very volatile and, and changing significantly over time, um, we can spin these off into a separate mini dimension and have it tied to the fact table. Uh, so here um, we, uh, we see um, as an example, uh, the age, this is a band of ages, uh, a band of incomes and a band of uh, purchases um, for this uh, customer demo dimension. And so uh, this dimension would have every possible combination of um, these particular values. And then the one that applies uh, for the particular instance of this customer dimension for this record in the fact table is the one that would get joined. And then once you spin off those rapidly changing attributes, the remaining attributes in the, the dimension uh, can uh, continue to be implemented as a, a type one, two, or three SCD. And for more information, there's a link here to talk about that. Um, beyond that, there are, um, you'll, you'll find discussions about uh, higher types of SCDs. Uh, they go on up to five, six, seven. And from what I found is that they're not very standardized. Depending on the site you go to, um, you can have different people defining them in different ways. Um, the only consensus that I found is that in some way, shape or form, they're usually hybrids of some of the more standard types of, uh, of SCDs, uh, most notably the one, two, and three. Um, and the four is uh, um, maybe not quite as common as the other types, but it still does come up from time to time. Um, so for instance, you'll see a type five, um, which should be a combination of the type one and type four. So essentially you have a, a copy of the the mini dimension, but it's joined directly to the base dimension instead of joined via the, vac the fact table. And then, um, uh, and then you have the type one for the remainder of the, the values where um, uh, attribute values just get overwritten. Uh, and then type six, uh, this is another one where, um, let's see, so some, uh, you, you'll have, the versioned records with the row effective dates um, for the, the full history. Um, but then you also have um, another column that shows the current value. So in this one for department name, we have the full history of the department for uh, this particular product. Um, but then we also have a separate one that has the current department name. So you can see the full history is like a type two having the current department and the historic department, that's like a type three. And the fact that we need to do an in-place update to constantly keep the current department up to date with what the, the current value is across all of these records, um, that's like a type one. So if you add them together, this hybrid, you get a, a type six. And again, more information about these different SCD types. Um, let's see the fact tables, uh, talking about this, uh, when you're building them out, you should try and identify the lowest level of granularity that you're gonna be needing for your reporting and build your fact tables at that level. Uh, so get as much detail as possible as you can uh, because you can aggregate it uh, in your queries, but you can't drill down any further if you have something that's more generalized 
and uh, and you haven't set up the the granularity to, to be able to drill down. Um, again, like I mentioned, the combination of all the keys um, should uh, be able to uniquely identify a record. Um, and then you use your ETL processes um, for, for doing lookups to get these keys from the dimensions uh, for your referential integrity. Um, sometimes you'll need aggregated fact tables. So particularly if you have a very large fact table, um, but people are doing reporting at a, a higher level. Um, sometimes just for performance reasons, you can create aggregated versions of your fact tables, which will be essentially just a copy, but where you'll, you'll aggregate the values at a higher level of granularity. So for instance, fact purchase might be very granular down to the order level and the specific date, um, but you have a similar version of this table, uh, fact monthly product sales, where you're rolling up all of the purchases for from a particular person um, up to the month level or for, for various products rather. Um, and then finally a note about uh, OLAP cubes and, and the tabular data model. Um, once you have your star schema in place, then um, you have other tools at your disposal to be able to um, further be able to analyze your data. Um, so uh, when we talk about cubes, these technically, uh, relate to data that's being processed into a multidimensional model um, within an OLAP database. So for instance, the uh, SQL Server Analysis Services uh, multidimensional model. Um, so these cubes have a, a definite definition of fact tables and dimensions. Dimensions are defined, fact tables are also known as uh, measure groups. And so the facts are the, the metrics that you're going to be aggregating and the dimensions are the, the various um, slicers across which you can aggregate those. Um, the, the SSAS cubes, um, or well, the, the multidimensional, when uh, analysis services first came out, multidimensional was the only mode that was offered. And um, the SSAS multidimensional, it's file-based storage. Um, one of the, the big powerful um, components of this is that the storage, when, it, when you're processing your cubes, um, not only will it process your data at the lowest level granularity defined by your fact tables, but it will also do pre-aggregations um, of commonly used uh, um, slices of your data based on how users are, um, are aggregating that data across the various dimensions. Um, so, so yeah, the people were using the, the multidimensional and, and these cubes for quite some time. Um, the fact that SSAS was included for free um, with SQL Server licenses um, contributed to widespread adoption of, um, of the, the multidimensional uh, uh, databases. Um, and so people just became, uh, came to the point where they um, equated analysis services, SSAS with cubes. So if it's in SSAS, it's a cube. Um, and that, that nomenclature continued even after the introduction of tabular mode within um, analysis services. So uh, there's uh, another mode now that exists within SSAS um, that's a tabular model. And these, instead of being stored in file-based storage, these are more memory-based and the data is processed in a, a memory cache. And the tables are all um, really considered equally. So there's not really a sense of fact tables versus dimension tables, though you still can build your relationships between the tables in your model. Um, and so these uh, models within SSAS they're not technically cubes, um, even though people do still call them that. Um, but yeah, th this is the tabular model. And the tabular model, this is the same engine used uh, by Power BI behind the scenes. Um, and so we've seen that as uh, Microsoft puts more emphasis on Power BI, that, and, uh, and in particular, the, the tabular model, um, we're seeing that that has been supported a lot more. and the multidimensional model really is not receiving any more attention um, from the development teams at Microsoft. Um, and I don't know that it's even really being built out at all anymore. 
And in fact, it's not even an option within Azure Analysis Services. The only way you can set up a multidimensional database in SSAS is to have either an on-prem installation or um, install it on a VM. And then even um, SSAS tabular mode is being de-emphasized um, over Power BI. Um, Microsoft is really pushing toward Power BI adoption and uh, very soon it will contain a superset of features um, compared to what is available in SSAS tabular. Um, so you can see 